wish you had something super cool that you, when you were a kid that was spiritual that would have got you hooked. How many of you know what I'm saying? How many of you remember when you were a kid, it was not cool, it was goofy? How many of you know what I'm saying? And I was just like, no, not into that. But what it is, is that we believe that Jesus is greater than any temptation that is out there. He is greater than any temptation. And so we just set the table. He shows up and he changes people's hearts and he changes people's lives. Amen. Lord, as we get into your word today, we thank you for it. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We want to grow. We're here, Lord, because we want to get we want to be close to you, close, Lord, with our brothers and sisters in Christ and grow deeper in your ways. And Lord, we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, just something really quick also is that we're gonna, there's going to be some summer service time changes. We're going to tweak the summer service times a little bit. And actually, 11 o'clock service is not going to affect you guys at all. But the 930 service is going to go to 9 o'clock. And so it gives us, because it's a little crowded sometimes, the um, going between, if, if the preacher goes three minutes too long, three people get run, no, I'm kidding, is, um, and so we're, so the nine o'clock service is going to be at 930, and the 11 o'clock service is going to stay at 11, and then for the summer, we're encouraging the one o'clock, we're going to bring them into those two services, because summertime people are doing their vacations and all that kind of stuff, so we're going to, there's just going to be two services for the summer, Make sure, plan on be there. Huh? What did I say? Did I say 9, 30, and 11? 9 and 11 starts June 2nd, which is the first Sunday after Memorial Day. So just jot that down. Is it the services will be what time? You guys did better than me. All right, are we ready to get into the Word today? I want to talk this morning about faith in my now. Faith in my now. When you when I make that statement is that what I have found out is our now is constantly changing. How many of you found that out? Right now, you're just doing awesome, and you can pull out of the parking lot, pull in front of somebody, and they inform you that you are number one. How many of you know what I'm saying? And it's like, whoa, I want to go back to church. How many of you know what I'm saying? Your now, it just changed. It just changed. And we live in this world where it's changing. See, our faith, or we could say our trust, is what gives us the ability to, to rest to be at peace and to have an optimistic outlook, to have strength where we're at, to have joy in our life. And if your if, if you're outside or your inside peace is based on something on the outside, you're going to live in this topsy-turvy up and down. But what God wants to show us how to do is to have faith in our now. That God, this is going on right now, and I need you to help me to trust you in this now. See, what it is is our faith or our trusting when things are going good is awesome, but I want to tell you it is even more important that we can have faith when the stuff is changing, when, stu- when things are going on, when stuff is happening in, in our life. You know, when I, some of you don't know the story, some of you do, but um, 19 years ago when we moved here, uh, they they actually they they asked us to come and I think Micah was like seven or eight and Josh was like five and all the kids were in there and we were in San Diego and they asked us um, we were referred this, this church needed a pastor and so we were referred from Res Live Pastor Dwayne's my pastor and um, we were referred and we weren't really looking but they just called and and I felt like okay well we should go and. And, um, and so we came and vacationed that year in Michigan, and, and I came and preached. And after I got done preaching, the board came to me, and they said, we feel like that you're supposed to be the next pastor. They said that. And I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I, I hadn't really, I was just kind of being obedient, and just going to preach. And so I didn't have any moment or anything. And so I just looked at them and said, well, okay, I tell you what, I don't really know. Um, I'm here with my family, and so what we'll do is um, we'll get away, and I'll pray, and we'll spend a couple, and I'll get back with you, and I'll let you know. And so about three days later, and I, I prayed about it, and I just had a, a deep peace on the inside. I never had, a, you know, a, a Moses moment. How many of you know what I mean? This is God. 
God. <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? I don't get those. I wish I did, but I don't. And, um, and, uh, and, and so I just had a peace on the inside. And then what I do whenever I'm making those kind of decisions um, in my life is I had that peace. And then I go, I typically go to some friends that, that I confide in, that I stop and I trust them and I listen to them because they got no skin in the game and they hear from God and they're going to give me their a gut level. And so I went to a couple of my friends and I said, hey, this is what's going down. And Daniel, uh, Pastor Daniel was one of those, and James DeMello, and just a couple of them. And so um, they, I said, pray about it, and just tell me what you're feeling and what you think. And so they called me, and they said, man, I don't know. They said, I don't want to tell you this, but I feel like this might be God for you. And so I was just like, oh, and I talked to my wife, and she was like, it ain't God. <laughs> she was, and then the Lord showed her. The Lord showed her. Be willing to let go. And so she's like, okay, I'm willing to, okay. And, and so, it, I, and so I, I called the board, you know, and, and, and I said, okay, you know, I, I, um, I'll, I'll do it. And then they said, okay, when can you come? And I said, I don't know. I said, I have no idea. I got a house out there. I got a business out. I got all kinds of stuff out there. I said, I don't know. It could be six months. could be nine months. I was almost like, you might not want me. You know what I'm saying? And they looked at me and they said, we'll wait. And I'm like, well, okay. And so we flew home and, and, uh, and when we got home, you know, I told, my friend, told some friends and stuff like that. We put our house up for sale and it sold in the first 24 hours for full asking price, cash, and they wanted us out in 30 days. How many of you would say that's God? Let me just, okay, let me just throw this, lean in on, on, on this little caveat. So we pulled the trigger. I called the board. This is incredible. And they're just like, this is God. I said, we're going to be there in less than 30 days. I said, we called the moving company. We scheduled the move. We've got to get you here in like 10 days, two weeks, or we're adjusting our schedule. We're going to, okay, we'll make it happen. And then, we, and then we're kind of telling all of our friends, and we're start packing. And about 36 hours go by, and the person that was paying cash in full price, they said, we've changed our mind. I'm going to kill somebody. How many of you know what I'm saying? How many of you have ever felt like, you know what I'm saying, Christian-wise, you know. <laughs> Christian sniper. You know, <laughs> you go there. But I was like, Jim, can you relate? Oh, my gosh. I was just like, my wife goes, we need to talk. I said, I can't talk. I just can't. I said, I can't talk. I said, baby, I, you got to let me alone. I'm going to let me alone. I'm like. Wait, now, I want to ask you a question. Earlier, I asked y'all if it was God. And y'all were like, yes. Now, is it not God? Because it all fell apart. I mean, let me just throw this out there. Is it not God? Is God still in charge? What has gone south? Me. <laughs> I looked at my wife. And we lived like a quarter mile. I could walk to the beach. I said, I'm going to the beach. I'm taking a walk. I said, I've got to pray. I don't know when I'm coming home. I said, I'm just, I said, I just got, and I went down there and I'm just praying. And I, my emotions are just like, just raw. How many of you can relate to this? I am just like, oh my gosh. How could, Lord, why could, oh, how could, and I'm just like, and I'm like, I got to get myself quiet to hear from the Lord, because everything is just like raging, you know, just like, I got to get quiet, so I like walking and praying and walking and praying, and I'm just like, Lord, I need you to help me get quiet, because I can't hear anything, because I'm so in turmoil right now, and finally got quiet, and I just had a peace on the inside, and I'm like, just had it. Peace was still there. And I went home and told my wife. I said, I, 
my wife, how many of you know, thank God for good women. Let me just tell you, just an inside track. If you're married and you think your wife's a bad woman, let me just tell you this. She's a good woman. You're just in a bad spot. Thank you. <laughs> and so I went home and she said, well, we prayed. I think we should go. She said, what do you want to do? But I think we should go. So I said, okay. Okay. So we did everything, packed it up, left our house, left all our furniture, left, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and came and pulled the trigger. But my faith went for a nosedive. See, there's certain environments that faith and trust is easier. And there's other environments that we've got to be intentional. We have, we have got to be tension, intentional. God wants to grow my trust threshold in him no matter what is going on down here. He wants to grow my faith threshold and my trust threshold. He wants me to learn to trust him when I don't get it. Anybody can trust when you can figure it all out. But I'm going to tell you, if you can figure it all out, it isn't faith. When you can't figure it out is when faith shows up. And what it is, is the higher my trust or my faith threshold is, the higher my peace, my joy, my ability to rest. I'm going to throw that out again. I said the higher, some of us right now, we're like, I can't rest. I can't be at peace because of this. God wants to grow your trust threshold. He wants to grow your faith threshold so that you can have faith in your now. He doesn't want our life controlled by the craziness of the world we live in. He wants us to learn to be led by his spirit, guided by his peace, and anchored on his word. But what that means is there's going to be times that it's just like with me. Yeah, I mean, think about it. I'm like, I mean, I said, okay, Lord, I'm willing to forsake all. We're letting everything go. We're going to step out and follow you. And in the next breath, I mean, my brain is saying, Lord, why did you even let this person come in and make an offer? Have them have a heart attack or get in a car accident before they show up. My wife's giving me the face. I'm joking, kind of. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Why did, Lord, they just, oh, oh Lord. And, but what it is, is realize that Jesus compared our trust or our faith in God to three things. One, he said it's like a mustard seed that, smarts, that starts small, but over time it becomes the biggest thing in our garden. It becomes greater than anything else. He, he compared it to corn. And he said the way corn is, is it starts off as a seed. Then it's the stalk, the blade, the ear, and the full corn in the ear. He compared it, our faith or our trust in him to a servant. And a servant causes us to rest because we know that it's working. It's going to happen and it's all going to come together and it's all going to work. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. It says, now, everybody say now. now. Faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. Look at that statement. When does it happen? Now. God said, I just want to let you know whatever's going on right now in your life, Mike, now faith will bring your hopes into reality and become the foundation for everything that you need to acquire the things that you long for. For it is all the, ev all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. God is saying, I want you to develop in trust with me. I need you to develop in trust with me. And when we do what 
happens is, is we can have peace in the middle of chaos. When the world is freaking out and flipping out and things aren't going, we can stop and say, okay, you know what? My root system is deeper than what I'm seeing right now. That my belief and my faith is not in something I can control, although I would like to, but I can't control it. And because I can't, I'm not going to hold on, manipulate, or get try to get people to do things so that I can feel like I'm in control. I know the one who's in control. And no matter what you do, God will turn it for my certain good because he's a good God. He's a good God. Give God a shout. See, if, if we've got to understand before we'll trust, the life of faith is going to be hard. It's just going to be hard because we're not in control. There's this illusion that we think we're in control. True life is coming to the place of being good with it and growing deeper in my understanding of the God who loved me so much. He, he gave his only begotten son, betting I would respond to a relationship with him and then trusting that he's navigated my life. That's what it is. That's where peace comes from in our life. Look at what it says in, in Proverbs 3, verse uh, 5 through 7. It says, trust in the Lord completely and don't rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all. How many of you are with me on that? How many, you know, and so what it is, is what I want to teach on today is this, is developing that trust or that faith in my now. I know right now some of us, are everything is going great, but there's others of us, you're sitting here, and you're just like, I sure hope God's in charge, because if he ain't, it isn't pretty. It, it isn't pretty. I'm just an encouragement to you. God's in charge. He's, but he, what he wants to do is you to anchor on him. So what I want to do is we're going to look at a story by the name of Zacchaeus. Everybody, guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Everybody say Zacchaeus. And I'm going to start reading in Luke chapter 19. And we're going to actually draw five things from this to developing our trust or our faith in our now. Luke 19 verse 1. It says, in the city of Jericho there lived a very wealthy man. Everybody say a very wealthy man. And his name was Zacchaeus, who was the supervisor over all the tax collectors. Pause for a moment. That statement says a lot. Realize this, that when Rome would conquer an area, what they would do is they would look for people who were plugged in and who were well-connected in communities. And the reason they did is because they had no social security system. They had no mail system. They couldn't text anybody. They couldn't connect. And so what Rome would do is let's just say that these are three communities. Rome would come into this community and they would say, who is the most influential in this community? we got a fourth community up in the balcony. Who's the most influential in this community that we can get them to turn on their own people? And what they will do is they will inform us of how much everybody is worth, how much they make, and then we will make them the tax collector collector over that particular area and then they will come and they will be responsible to us. And the Bible says that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. So what that means is probably Zacchaeus was over a region like a county and he was one of he was probably the one that would go outside to these communities, find out who was an influential Hebrew Jewish person that knew the the gist of what was going on in each community and he would bribe them and get them to flip and what would happen is is then let's just say Tommy's taxes are 10 bucks and if I was a tax collector Tommy couldn't get around it because I knew his stuff and so I would look and see Tommy I know your stuff you owe me 10 bucks You're, but I wouldn't tell him 10 bucks it was a normal thing back then that I would tell him 11 or 12 and I would take the dollar or two and put it in my pocket and then turn the 10 over to Rome. And then Rome would also give me a little kickback from that. 
And the taxes were so oppressive in some areas of back when Rome was, was over those areas that if the people couldn't pay their taxes, they would demand that their sons and daughters were sold into slavery in order to pay their taxes. So you could imagine the depth of, the, of despise. This guy is a chief tax collector. And Jesus, and so it says about him that, that it says that, that Zacchaeus, who was a supervisor over the tax collectors, as Jesus made his way through the city, Zacchaeus was eager to see Jesus. He kept trying to get a look at him. But the crowd around Jesus was massive. Zacchaeus was a very short man. How many of you remember the Zacchaeus story? Zacchaeus was a wee, that's dumb, my wife said. Okay. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a very, how many of you know the Lord loves short people? Bobby Joe, put your hand up. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a very short person, and he couldn't see over the heads of the people. Now look at verse 4. So he ran ahead of everyone and climbed up a blossoming fig tree so that he could get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. When Jesus got to the place, he looked up into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I'm appointed to stay at your house today. So he scurried down the tree, came face to face with Jesus. As Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, look at this. Many in the crowd complained. Look at this. Of all the people to have dinner with, he's going to go eat in the house of a crook. Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visit to his house. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, Half of all that I own I will give to the poor. And, the Lord, and Lord, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as I stole. Verse 9 and 10, Jesus said to him, This shows that today life has come to you and your household. For you are, a, you are a true son of Abraham. The son of man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. What I want you to notice is this. Is where did Zacchaeus start? And this is number one. He just said, I want to be closer to Jesus. That's what he said. Let me just realize this. Faith in my now is directly linked to my closeness to Jesus. It is not a, something you go get at Walgreens. It is not something that you can just, it is, realize this, now faith, trust starts in my heart posture that says, Lord, I want to be closer to Jesus. No matter what is going on, no matter who I'm around, okay, it's hot, okay, I can't get there, whatever it is, Lord, I want to be closer to Jesus. I want to get closer. See, we can get so wrapped up in our needs and needing faith that we forget that our number one need is to be close with Jesus. Jesus. We're, what we're doing is we're like, Lord, I need you to do this, 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 and this. That's great. God knows what you need, but the greatest thing you need is to be closer to him because when you're closer to him, the impact of that need will look very different. And so in our lives, what we've got to do, and I love this about Zacchaeus. See, God blesses our life, but that's not our number one motive. Our motive is I want to be closer to Jesus. This was unplanned. Not by Zacchaeus. Jesus just happened to be passing by. And, he, and what it was is that he wasn't going to let this moment pass by. He sees Jesus. He's heard about Jesus. And he's not going to let that moment slip by. He just wanted to see. He just wanted to get closer. Possibly to know in a deeper way. And I am convinced that in our life that every day the Lord is saying, here is a moment for you to get close to me. Here is a moment for you to get close to me. And what it is, is relational, is I want to know Jesus. I believe that there's a misconception today about faith. People have this misconception. It's like, I just need greater faith. Well, what is greater faith? Trust. Well, how do you have trust in a deeper relationship? That's what it is. If you were to come up to me and you were to say to me something about my wife, you were to say to me, you know, I saw, I saw Pastor Jill hanging out at this bar. How many of y'all know? I would laugh at you. And you know why I would laugh at you? Because I know the woman. <laughs> okay. And when we know him, it has an impact on everything. And that God wants us to come to the point in our heart and in our life where that's deep. See, the deeper the relationship, the stronger the trust. 
Number two is this. Is his belief stirred a plan that led to an appointment? What he believed stirred a plan. He said, I can't see him. I can't get close enough. There's a tree. He ran it. He had a plan. I'm going to climb up into that tree. And then it, what it led is to an appointment. Look at what it says in verse 5. When Jesus got to that place, he looked up into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Now look at this. For I am appointed to stay at your house today. What would have happened if Zacchaeus as a, it would have just made an excuse? Crowd's too big, too hot, too much snow. Not enough snow, too much rain, windy, I got this baggage, I can't do this, people are going to continue. What would have happened? We'd have never had any record of him. He'd have never had a life-changing encounter. See, stated belief without action isn't a belief, it's a fantasy. That's what it is. And that when we have a belief, it needs to be more than stated, it needs to be connected to an action. And when it's an action, what it is, is it stirs us to something. You know, that this was, this was risky, this action that he had taken. He had never done this before. But when we make up our minds to do what it takes to get close, we'll have divine appointments. We, I have had just times with the Lord that I'm like, I didn't know. And I, it was just, God just said, you know what, I'm just going to, in a very personal, real way, connect with you. Number three is this is that his hunger had more influence over him than personal weakness and condemnation. His hunger in his life had more influence over him than personal weakness and condemnation. Do you know what his name means in the Hebrew? Zacchaeus, it's a Hebrew name. He's Jewish. His name means clean and pure. Now, if that is not an oxymoron, how many of you know what I'm saying? There, oh, here comes clean and poor, or I mean clean and pure. Here comes clean and pure that is the chief tax collector. That's what his name meant. But if you look at Zacchaeus, is, I mean, you stop and you think about it, is that he, if you look at the, what he did, is that he stopped and it says that he was a supervisor of the tax collectors and his name was clean and pure. Think about this for a moment. He had to have a greater hunger than what other people thought and what other people said about him. Sometimes in our lives, we are so controlled about what everybody else thinks. Oh, they're not going to like this. Oh, they'll say this. Oh, they won't do. How about you stop and say, you know, it really doesn't matter what somebody else says. What matters is what God thinks. And you know what I'm going to do? If I live my life to please everybody else, I will be a miserable rig because people cannot be pleased. God is easy to please. And that we come to a spot in our life and in our heart. Number four is this. Is he brought Jesus into his home and into his relationships. See, for, for me to have faith in my now, it's got to manifest in my home around my friends, and where I live. If I'm going to have overcoming in my now, it can't be a quiet thing. It's got to be a real thing. And it's got to be something that is not hidden or covered, but it's out there. You sometimes hear people say, well, I have a really private and I have a real personal faith. And that's true, and I'm not minimizing that at all. But realize this, when it's private, the Lord will place me in situations to get it to go public. He will put me in a situation that I will either have to compromise it or I'll have to stand up for it. One or the other, because he's wanting it deeper in our lives. There's no such thing in, in Christianity as compartments. Oh, I have my this box and this box and this box and this box. No, Jesus is the box and there ain't no other boxes that count but him. And so we stop in our life and we say, okay, Lord, I realize. And number five is this. Is his faith affected his motives? Remember what his motives were before? He would turn on his own people for money. He would turn on the Jewish people for money. What I want you to notice what it says about him in this particular story is that look at what it, it, what it says about him in verse 8. It says, half of all that I own, now look at this, I will give to the poor. Look at the statement. He has had an encounter with Jesus. 
His motives have changed. And now, before it was all about money, now he said, you know what? Because of this encounter with Jesus, I will now, not yesterday, now. I will from this day forward, I will now. Look at what he said. He said, I promised, he said, I will give to the poor. He said, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, and in Luke 12, 34, that where our money is, it reveals where our heart is. And what you see right here is Zacchaeus had an incredible change of heart. His heart totally changed, and it led to the next thing. And we look at what Jesus said in verse 9 and 10. Jesus said to him, this shows, what shows? What he just said he was going to do. This shows that today life has come to you and your household. For you are a true son of Abraham. The son of man has come to seek out and to give life to those who are lost. You know this story, what it's about? Is Jesus is not exclusive. He's not exclusive. He doesn't look at where you were raised. He doesn't look at your past. He doesn't look at what you, you know, the, 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 the wrong bends and the wrong things that you've done. He doesn't look at that. What he looks at is he says, the past isn't important, but where your heart is today, that's what matters. And you look at Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is at a spot where everybody despises him but Jesus. I want to tell you something. No matter where you're at right now, Jesus is not counting you out. He's counting you up. But only you can say, Lord, I realize that right now my life is sideways. Maybe it's because of things you've done. Maybe it's not because of things you've done. And you're just in the heat right now, and you don't know what's going on. God is saying, I want to teach you how to have faith in your now. That when stuff's not, you can stop and say, Lord, what I realize is my number one need is not for this thing to go away. My number one need is to get close to you. And that if I get close to you, it will have less effect on my life. And you will have an influence over my decisions. And my decisions today are what I live in tomorrow. But I am the only one. I want us to just stand to your feet, if you would. We're going to be receiving communion today. And you'll notice that we have a communion table here and here. There's one in the back and there's one in the balcony. But what's really I think when you think about communion, some people, if you're new here and you're like, you know, I've never really, I, what do you, I'm used to the, the plate going by and getting communion that way. We do this because we feel like it takes a greater level of commitment for you to step out of your seat and have an engagement with the Lord than just take something off a plate that's passing by right in front of you. But what it is, is I believe when you look at this, the grape juice is symbolic of the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. The bread is symbolic of the broken body of Jesus to bring healing to your life. And that today I believe that the Lord is saying to us, I need you to examine your heart right now. I need you to examine right now what's going on. It's nobody else's. It wasn't their job to examine Zacchaeus's heart. It was Zacchaeus's job to examine his heart. And that right now the Lord is saying, I need you to examine your heart. And is there anything right now that you can stop and you can say, Lord, I've gotten off track. Lord, I'm not where I need to be. God is not saying to you, fix it or get it together. He's saying that as you come up and you take a piece of bread and you dip it in there, you give it to me and you invite me in to that area of your life. And the power of the resurrected Savior will come into that area and will begin to help, lead, guide, and direct. But God waits just like Zacchaeus had to make up his mind to climb up in the tree. We got to make up our mind that, Lord, I'm going to get myself in a spot that, Lord, it isn't about my past. It isn't about what I've been through. It's not about what I'm currently struggling. It's about what you did for me, what you have paid for. And right now, I identify with Jesus. And so they're going to lead us in worship. But I'm going to pray. And then you can just make your way out of your seat to go right by these tables and dip it in. And just between you and Jesus, 
Right now, Jesus is wanting to lift your spirit. Amen? Amen. I tell you what, Zacchaeus got the biggest lift up that day that he ever had in his entire life, and it changed his heart. Lord, we thank you today. Lord, we realize that, Lord, we have faith to go to heaven, but you want us to have faith in our now. What's going on right now in our life? To be able to trust you, to be able to have peace, to be able to go to sleep and have a deep rest. Lord, to be able to have optimism about our future. Lord, we thank you that you have our life, that you're directing our life. And we invite your Holy Spirit to take us deeper, Jesus. Yes, take us deeper, Jesus. You know, the Lord's saying to somebody here, you just need to make up your mind. Yes. Make up your mind today. Make up your mind to be a person of faith. Make up your mind to follow Jesus. Make up your mind to stop condemning yourself for your past and for your mistakes and for the things that you've done wrong. Make up your mind, somebody in this place. Make up your mind yes. to be a child of God, yes. a son and heir. Make up your mind. Joshua made up his mind and he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Choose life this day. Choose life. It's all about your choices and making up your mind, somebody. You know, Joshua was one of them that went in to the promised land. God has promises for your life, and he wants you to make up your mind like Joshua did. Joshua said, I'm going to choose life. My family's going to choose life, and we're going in. And he went in, I'll tell you, he went in. You know, he came up to the land, and they all complained, thought they couldn't go in looked at them giants or whatever that was in the land, thought they couldn't do it, but God said they could. And Joshua made up his mind to believe what God said. And he, and he ran his clothes that day and he said, oh, don't you not believe the word of the Lord? Let's believe God today. Let's believe what he says today. And because Joshua believed, now the rest of them didn't believe. They didn't make up their mind. And so because they didn't, lots of them died in the wilderness. You all remember the story. You all think that they went there last, but they went there first. They went to the promised land first. God had promised them first. God has made promises to you today. And he's taken you up to that place, and he wants you to believe what he said. He wants you to choose life and make up your mind today in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Can we do something right now? Say this with me. Say, Lord, I've made up my mind. I'm coming after you in spite of what's going on. I need you more than any other need in my life. Reveal yourself to me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure I felt like of just grass that needed water. You know, and, and all of us know, right, when you got a neighbor that their lawn is just toast, right, compared to a, na a neighbor that takes care of it. You know, and, and I just felt like, you know, when we come to church, it's, it's truly up to us how much water we receive. You know, like, it's, it's truly up to you if you want to be watered or not. I mean, we can literally throw buckets at you, but if you're not in a place to receive, then your lawn ain't getting watered. And, and I felt a lot of the times we come to church services and we, and it's almost like we have this excuse of like, well, that message spoke to me and that one didn't. Or I like that song, but you know, that other one, I just wasn't feeling it. And it's funny because like my life, I've literally sat and Pastor Mike, I've listened my entire life to him. So if anybody has an excuse to maybe not listen or check out, I feel like I heard all the jokes. I've, I've heard all the songs. I've done it all in my opinion. And so often we disconnect from the emotion and the depth of God based, based off of the perception of how deep we are. And, oh, that one doesn't apply to me. Or, oh, that one's not really for me. Or, oh, you know what, that song. Or, you know, those people worship like that. That's not really how I worship. Or, you know what, I can receive, but at the same time, I'm playing in my week half the time I'm listening. If you could for a moment allow God to just water your lawn. 
Some of us right now, the only thing we need is water, and we're staring at a pool, wondering why we can't get any. So as Saul lets us, leads us again, I promise you this, the people who need it the most are the ones who show it the least. Yikes, that'll preach. I said the people who need it the most show it the least. If you need it, why don't you show it? If you need it, why don't you sing it? If you need it, why don't for a moment you open up your heart and see if it'll water your love? Let's go. You know what's funny about that story is, um, you know, first off, I find it ironic that, you know, Zacchaeus' name's pure and clean, but everybody's perception of him is the exact opposite of that. I mean, how often do we believe the perceptions people place on of us versus what God says about us? Right, so we almost accept what culture's definition of your mistakes are instead of actually accepting what the Bible's definition of a son and daughter is. And it's fascinating to me because we see insight into Jesus speaking directly to the man he created him to be, not the one that his choices maybe have backed him into a corner of, not necessarily the one that everybody hates, but he's speaking to the man he created him to be. And some of us, right, the greatest lie we can ever believe is that God didn't create us with purpose, is God didn't create us with destiny, is God didn't create us with a plan. And I find it fascinating, right? Jesus speaks to the name, but also what's interesting, and many of you guys maybe have not known this, but when I was studying the story of Zacchaeus, it says he climbed a sycamore tree. And a sycamore tree is a tree that that sheds its, its outer bark. And as it sheds its bark, what it does is it allows sunlight, it, it conducts photosynthesis not through its leaves, but through the opening up and allowing sunlight into the innermost parts of the tree. How often do we just surround ourselves with this thick exterior and wonder why God hasn't gotten in? So when he climbed that tree, it was not just a symbol of him wanting to see Jesus. It was a symbol of him taking off that exterior and saying, Father, hit me in the core. So today, I feel like we're just... I'm going to wrap this up, but more than anything, I felt like all of us, that's an invitation. God sees you. God knows you. God created you. And may this be a day where we choose to not allow an external, just thick layer, not allow him to come in. So with that, if we could all bow our heads and close our eyes, and then if, if it's okay, let's all just open up our hands. Let's all just open up our hands and let's say this, Father... You can take off my exterior to allow that sunlight in. I give you control. I give you authority. I know I'm chosen by you. I know I'm created by you. I know I'm loved by you. I choose you, Jesus. My parting thought is this. I feel like there were people today who needed prayer and who needed to almost have a deeper revelation with some people after. Maybe you haven't made a decision to follow God or whatever. Ben's going to give instruction, but come up. I'll be up here too. So we thank you.